Game number 69 for the Boston Celtics will take place at Orlando against the Magic. This is the Celtics pregame report for CLNS Media. I'm your host, Josue Pavone, and I'm joined by Dan Greenberg, a.k.a. Greeny of Barstool Sports. Dan, welcome back to the pregame report. How's it going, man? Good to be here. Dan, you really want to talk about the Magic? I mean, because I don't either. All right, let's just jump in on some really, Celtics talk. No. No, we don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll get your prediction at the end. How's that sound? We'll, we'll, we'll get a little yeah, magic works. talk. That works. All right, so let's uh, let's start with Wednesday night's game. A double overtime thriller. Marcus Morris, Jason Tatum, Terry Rozier. I mean, they were running the show, and uh, they were impressive. I mean, considering the circumstances. No Irving, no Al Horford, no Jalen Brown, no Daniel Tice. But they did manage to blow a 20-point lead, however, and couldn't slow down the Wizards towards the end. Tell me, Dan, what's one thing you learned about this Celtics group from that loss? And what's one thing that sort of... What's one thing that confirmed what you already knew about these young guys? I'm saying that Yabu is a savior. Um, but aside from that, I mean, I think what we saw is they're maybe a little bit more ahead in their development than we thought. I mean, I really think that we're starting to see time and time again Terry Rozier step up in these big moments and, and become a, a big-time clutch scorer, whether it's shooting from, from deep or just you know making plays in, on the break. I was really impressed with his, with his, you know, he wasn't afraid of the moment. And I think we're seeing the same thing with Jason Tatum. I mean, yeah, he did miss out a couple free throws, which I, I lost sleep over. But he was aggressive, right? He wasn't afraid to, to take the shots down the stretch. You could argue that final shot, he should have taken it to the rim. But it just goes to show you the confidence that he has in his, you know, shooting ability and hesitation pull-up ability. Um, so there are positives to take away, but... Like you said, anytime you blow a 20 point lead at home to a team that just played out of back to back, you know, that's not. That's not an ideal situation. So Marcus Smart went to New York. Uh, he wants to see a, a hand specialist to see if he, in fact, does need season-ending surgery. Uh, Danny Ainge showed some optimism, you know, in a, in a recent interview saying uh, that they'll give it a week or so, a couple of days, to see if uh, he needs to just be taped up and, and, and be ready to play. Or if he actually needs surgery, they're going to have to go down that road. Greeny, if things do go south and Marcus Smart is out for the season, what does that do to, for the Celtics' chances of coming out of the East in next month's playoffs? I mean, it obviously hurts. He's a big-time rotational player. Um, a lot of people talk about what that means for the second unit, but, you know, if you watch a lot of Celtics teams, you'll notice Marcus Smart is a closing basketball player for this team. So that then tells you, okay, is, is Rozier going to be able to step up and fill that role? Is that now going to be more of a Marcus Morris situation? Of all the injuries that they've sustained, I feel like, you know, losing Kais, losing, you know, Jalen for this stretch, Losing Marcus Smart probably impacts them the most just because you can throw him on a big, you can throw him on a guard, you can have him run point, you can play him off the ball. He just does so many things for your versatility. I don't know if he is willing to just play one-handed, but not having him, I mean, that that really makes a, a deep playoff run even more challenging. This edition of the Celtics pregame report is brought to you by SeatGeek. Download the SeatGeek app for the best deals in sports and concert tickets. And when you enter the promo code Garden Report, you save twenty dollars off your first purchase. All you have to do is download the SeatGeek app, enter the code Garden Report, and you save twenty dollars off your first purchase. One encouraging sign throughout this week of slate of injuries is Kyrie Irving making the trip with the Celtics for this two-game road trip that starts in Orlando and ends in New Orleans. The Celtics are now four and a half games behind the Raptors for first place, and with Irving coming back into the fold, do you think the Celtics can actually make a run at first place, or do you think they should just hold things down in the second seed and, and move on forward from there? Yeah, I think it's still alive, just because they still play them, you know, head-to-head two more times. Um, it's really just, we'll, we'll know probably, you know, halfway through this trip, whether they're just going to start sitting guys. And, you know, it really just depends on what happens with Cleveland. I think if Cleveland drops down to the four seed, the Celtics, they shouldn't really care about that top seed. But if Cleveland plays well and finishes on the third seed, then the number one seed becomes all that more important so you can avoid them, you know, potentially until the Eastern Conference Finals. But while you said it was good news that Kyrie's coming back, I'm going to go the other way. I'm reading all these reports how Ainge is saying he's definitely going to need surgery at some point. I feel like even if they knew that that was going to happen when they made the trade, when you're a young 20-something player and we're talking about multiple knee surgeries to clean stuff up, I mean, that, that has me shook a little bit. I can't lie. 
Yeah, I mean, we know we all heard that report out of Cleveland, you know, when the trade went down that he did threaten to go out and get that, you know, just so he could sit out if he wasn't traded. So then, uh, you know, now that we're seeing this unfold, I'm sort of not surprised. But at the same time, I'm hoping that this isn't going to be detrimental to this year's run. I mean, if it's something he has to do next summer or even the year after that, I think he should get it done as soon as possible. But moving forward, I mean, we'll, we'll see. Hopefully he doesn't plague him throughout the postseason. Now going to be like a long term serious issue. I mean, they're going to have to pay him thirty five billion a year before mm. you know it. So you got to think. You know, obviously he's he's a no brainer for that max contract extension if healthy. But let's say he has the surgery this summer. He misses some time next year. I mean, you really have to think he's only twenty five. So you're investing in the next you know ten plus years maybe of his career. I don't know. I just get nervous anytime I hear knee injury, knee soreness, maintenance, tendonitis, and he's only 25 and is going to play, you know, hopefully these deep playoff runs for his time in, in Boston. It's, it's concerning. I'm, I'm maybe overly nervous, but still nervous. It kind of reminds me of Derrick Rose. Now, knock on wood for all you Celtics fans out there, but yeah, I, I see your point. I hope not. I mean, he was. If he's Derrick Rose, he's going to be out of the league in like two years. We've got a three-year window all of a sudden. Yeah, I can't have that. No, no, right. no, I can't have that. All right, all right. Let's let's uh, let's take a trip down memory lane. Let's do this. Okay, let's talk about what Ray Allen uh, has in store for us as his book is slated to release within the next uh, week and a half. Um, we got a sneak peek, uh, thanks to the sportingnews.com, got, a, got a, a first look at a couple of things that he had to say, not only about uh, his relationship with Ray John Rondo, but also a, a couple of stories that were uh, a bit eye-opening. Um, what were some of the things that sort of jumped out to you? I mean, there's, of course, the, uh, the, the, the trade that almost went down for Chris Paul. There's the trade that Ray Allen said that included him with them two going to Phoenix for Amari Stoudemire. I mean, obviously, Ray Allen has made a point throughout the last four years uh, or four, I should say six years, ever since he uh, he left for Miami, that his name was constantly dragged through trade rumors as one of the reasons why he decided to leave. But it also seemed like, of course, something that not it's not really news to us. A lot of it had to do with Ray John Rondo and how sort of he uh, was given the keys to lead the team when he was uh, he didn't have the best relationship with with, with Ray Allen. What did you make of all these quotes that came out from the uh, from the book? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't so surprising. Like you said, we knew that these two hated each other. I thought it was pretty really interesting how. Ray was pretty much like, you know, Rondo came to me and was basically like, I'm not passing you the ball anymore, which I find pretty interesting considering he's one of the greatest shooters of all time. Um, but I think that Chris Paul trade is, is interesting just because you think of all the dominoes. I mean, there was the whole Lakers fiasco. You don't have a lot of city. Um, so it's just a lot of things that, you know, and I have read that Ains was in love with Chris Paul even dating back to like 2005. So, it makes you wonder what this team, what this franchise would have looked like with a guy who was arguably one of the best guards in the league, for, you know, of all time for the most part. To be a Celtic would have been crazy, but it doesn't surprise me that, you know, Rondo was kind of a dick, Ray Allen was shopped in every trade you can imagine. I mean, that's all stuff that, you know, you heard the rumors, so when he confirmed it, it was kind of like whatever. But for me, it was more just like, wow, Rondo really hated this guy. Mm. Yeah, it seemed like... Uh... You know, the, for for him to to actually go out on a limb and say that he carried the team, if this is true, of course, according to Ray Allen, if he did in fact carry, if he did in fact say that he carried the team to a title in 2008, I, I think he's sadly mistaken. Yeah, I, I hate playing that game of like who had the most, the biggest role on that 2008 team, just because they don't win that title without every single one of those players filling that exact role. Agreed. I mean, yeah. Rondo, he wasn't he wasn't as important in terms of scoring as that big three, but as a starting point guard with that sort of, you know, it's on him to make sure everyone's getting involved. He had a couple big playoff games, so I don't know. I mean, obviously, it's not a shock to say Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, and Garnett were a main reason they won that title. But if you were to swap out Rondo with just some, you know, average player in the league, I'm not so sure that they win. So he was still important. I just think at this point we can all just agree and enjoy that they finally won a championship together. We'll see what happens. I mean, I, I'm definitely interested to read this book. I mean, Ray's got my attention here uh, from these uh, these clips that were, that were released this week. All right, I'll get you out on this. Um, prediction time. This is an Orlando Magic team that's fresh off an upset against the Bucks. I mean, there's no word if Aaron Gordon will be back in action. I mean, he's missed four straight since entering the NBA's concussion protocol. I mean, 
for guys like us who follow the Celtics, we all know how long that could take. But with that, with all that being said, who do you think wins tonight between the Celtics and the Magic? Um, I mean, the Celtics should win. I mean, they're a better team. They've they've beaten Orlando already. But at the same time, they can't just go in there and say, oh, we're just going to show up and win because we've seen them lose to pretty bad teams with that mentality. We saw Milwaukee not play a lick of defense the other night and give up 120-something points. Mm. Um, so I think if the Celtics, if they show up, if they, you know, if their perimeter defense is, is what we expect it to be, I mean, they should not lose this team to the team. If they do, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. You have to start thinking, <laughs> you know, they just had an all-star break, so they can't be, they can't be tired. Um, this is a game, especially after how they dropped it against Washington, this is one, go in, blow them out, rest as many of your main guys as you can, get Yabu some minutes, get Larkin some minutes. Um, but you have to be worried about them and their, you know, the magic ability to hit threes. I think they had two guys that combined for 13 threes against Milwaukee. Uh, you can't have that, but the Celtics should win this fairly easily. All right, he is Dan Greenberg of Barstool Sports. You can check out his stuff at barstoolsports.com. You can also give him a follow on Twitter at Still Greeny. That's at Stool Greeny on Twitter. Dan, I appreciate you taking the time, man. It's always fun talking Celtics with you. Absolutely. Well, that's going to wrap up this edition of the Celtics pregame report. Make sure you check out the Celtics postgame show on the clnsmedia.com website. You can call in toll-free at 347-215-7771 after the game to get on the air. Or just like this show, you can listen to it on demand on the CLNS Media mobile app. Weekday shows air on the Celtics News Feed channel on iTunes, Stitcher, and the CLNS Media mobile app. For today's Boston Celtics pregame report with Josue Pavone, this is Josue Pavone signing off.